So I think I might, just might, have a plastic crack addiction. I've been listening to the Night Lords trilogy for 40k, and um, I, I have a Lord Discordant now. But one of the luxuries I've been having as of lately, whenever I've been painting or building any new models, is to not have to listen to these phenomenal audiobooks or just simply music and other stuff through my phone, which is why instead I got this Cove speaker. This video is sponsored by Cove, and God bless that it is, because I freaking adore this thing. The sound quality that comes out of this, especially when you got those deep lows when you're listening to an audiobook or something, is just incredible. I'll go ahead and let you listen. Peering into the darkness that her handheld lamp back could only barely pierce. The beam of light lanced left and right, stabbing the gloom with weak illumination. Bare metal walls met her questing. And what's even better, this guy can get really loud. And if that there wasn't enough, you can have two. It's honestly fantastic, especially if you're doing any kind of painting or building or any kind of hobbying, because not only does it free up your ears and your head, but it allows it to be, you know, split into two so you can have it in different parts of the room, or if you've got multiple people working so it's not just coming out of one separate source. If you'd like to check out more about the Cove Split Speaker, you can check it out in the description and you can get 67 or more percent off using the promo code and the link down below. Thank you very much for sponsoring me, Cove, and let's get into the video. Hello everybody, my name is Bricky, currently serving 10 to life for spending 20 grand on the chair Lobo most recently sat on. <laughs> This is part two of the Every Legend Explained in Apex Legends. If you haven't seen part one, check the description or the card above me so you can watch that first. That being said, when I first discussed those main legends lore, I wanted to keep it a little bit, you know, simple, a little bit more of a condensed Cliff Notes version. However, I didn't really realize that their lore has been expanded on massively. I knew more was coming out, but I didn't think how far it went. For example, I didn't know why Bloodhound fought in the games originally. I now know that Bloodhound fights in the games so that their ex-lover Boone, who has recently died, can get into Valhalla by having Bloodhound compete to earn the favor of the gods. For my love, for Boone, I assure we will meet in the halls of Valhalla. That's fucking awesome, and I didn't know that because it's not anywhere. It's not on the legend bio, it's not even on the fucking wiki. The only place I was able to find this is if I, one, was playing during the Bloodhound event, which I really wasn't, or two, by finding a whole bunch of YouTube videos that explain it, which, I mean, give me a little bit of credit here, I don't really trust those very often because lots of lore YouTube videos are either speculation or kind of clickbait. But this is me saying, damn, I kind of fucked up. I didn't realize how far it had been continued and expanded on because it's not there in the places I was looking. So I got to say, my apologies, my bad. Some of your characters, I probably did a much more condensed or outdated version than it should have been. And hopefully I can rectify that by doing the new legends that I'm talking about today a lot more justice. So with that being said, luckily for me, our first legend that we're talking about is much easier to describe. And that's our boy, Octane. I saw someone, and I don't think they're selling cookies. Octavio Silva, which is one of the coolest names ever, is a speed freak, a thrill seeker, any title you want to give to a person who just loves doing death-defying stunts for the pleasure of it alone. He was born an heir to the Silva Pharmaceutical Company, and one day he just kind of got bored. Really bored. He decided he wanted to live life performing these, these death-defying stunts. He wanted to be a thrill seeker. He wanted to do crazy, crazy things. And he wanted to post it on the, whatever it Apex's version of the internet is, for adoring fans to gawk over. He loved it. Every second of it. It was like a drug to him. In fact, he went so far to the point where he decided to set a record at the local gauntlet by doing something that Titanfall fans will remember very well, grenade boosting in real life. 
Octavio Silva set the world record at that gauntlet by blowing his own legs off with a frag grenade. And when the doctor said that his death-defying, thrill-seeking stunt days were over because he has no usable legs, he turned to his friend AJ Shea, who, or at least I thought was a friend, but instead guilt-tripped her into having her fashion him a new set of legs. So now he is part of the most thrilling event in the galaxy, the Apex Games, because death-defying stunts are plentiful when you're competing in a blood sport. Passively, Octane regenerates health, just, you know, over time. His active lets him stim himself really hard with a little bit of druggy drug, lets him move faster, and it also takes a little bit of his, actually, now it's quite a bit of his HP away when he does it. And his ultimate is a giant pad that lets you soar into the sky, you, your teammates, enemies, whoever it was, at different angles, depending on how you hit it. It. Luckily for me, Octane is a simple character, and making his lore a little bit more complex I think goes against his whole point. Octane's whole entire persona is about having fun, having a good time, enjoying himself, just enjoying that speed freak nature. Octane is not only just hilarious, really fun to have on your team, and has some pretty great lines like how he talks about his legs cramping when he's driving a trident. He's got no legs. I don't think I've willingly killed myself more with any other character than it is with Octane. Because I throw a jump pad out, I see a team, I fly towards them because I'm thinking to myself, can't stop, won't stop. And do I die mid-air? Of course I do, but... I don't know, being tactical, this doesn't feel like it's an Octane's nature. And it's too bad, too, because I feel like Octane is starting to get that rap that Wraith originally had, where all of the really hardcore sweaty players are starting to move towards him, because he does encapsulate a lot of very good aggressive play. Gray AD strafing because of his extra stim, just increased speed in general, kind of a thin hitbox, and that ultimate is a great engage and disengage tool. Octane's kit, in a sense, is actually really, really good if you're thinking about Octane as a character. His kit matches his lore very well, and his lore is fun and flavorful. Which is unfortunate, because that means the fun-loving, exciting boy Octane is being played by, you know, those people, which are the exact opposite of everything Octane stands for. Personally, I think he's one of the best designed characters in the whole game. Now, balance here and there, he gets buffs and nerfs uh, every so often, but there are three major things that are important when it comes to creating a character. Good lore, good kit, and do they match? Octane, while simple, has some fun lore, his kit is very effective and strong, and his kit resembles his lore. It's the perfect trio. Honestly, Octane, while his name might get a little bit silly because of all of those players, there are very few times where I see Octane and I don't get a big smile on my face. So go out there, play some Octane, have a good time. That's a silly fence. That's a grumpy fence. That's a pretty fence. Natalie Paquette who was the daughter of, I'm going to assume it's Lou Paquette because the French don't pronounce consonants, who was the main electrical engineer behind the ring in the Apex Games. She and her father were really close, and Natalie had a bit of a hard time understanding other people. Electricity? She got perfectly, so her and her father were both esteemed electrical engineers and scientists, but she had a little bit of a hard time relating with other folks, so her and her father had a really close bond, both through the family connection and through their work. The day the new ring containment field was unveiled for the Syndicate, her father passed away, and being the only family, the only friend that Natalie had, it was completely devastating. She was found deeply depressed and sobbing underneath a kitchen table with no other family or friends to speak of. When, at that point, four people came to her side, Bangalore, Lifeline, Gibraltar, and even Caustic of all people together came to her and offered her a hand and said, hey, we are your family, we are your friends, and as far as we're concerned, the games are your new home. Now Watson competes in the Apex Games, not for money, not for the excitement or the thrill. She does it because this is her new family. These competitors are her new friends, and she has no other place she'd rather be. Passively, Watson slowly regenerates her own shields, and also Ultimate Accelerants will fully recharge her ult, not just a little bit. Her active allows her to place all of these fences that, when aligned together, create large electrical barriers that both slow and damage opponents. And her ultimate is an intercept pylon, which slowly regenerates the shields of nearby allies, and I think enemies, and also destroys all projectiles coming her way. That's grenades, airstrikes, etc. Do not loot her! Stop. 
Stop it. Stop it right now. Do not loot Watson. Don't do it. Okay, this... All of, all of this, get it away. Get it away. Be gone. Don't loot my sweet French autistic girl. Watson is just so fucking adorable. She's so fucking adorable, okay? She's a sweet little French girl who I, I think Respawn wanted to kind of hint that she might have had some kind of either autism or ADHD because it's talked about often she doesn't quite get people, but, you know, electrical engineering, she understands completely. And through her voice lines, she always talks about how lots of crowds bug her and then too much noise makes her kind of freak out a little bit and she likes the quiet she likes the silence so possibly she might have a slight little bit of autism or adhd or asperger's or something along those lines but that's not really the point the point of watson is that she's just so fucking cute that's why you can't loot her okay stop that you got many other options. She just brings this smile on my face every time i see her which is a little unfortunate because her kit it's not really for me. She's a much more defensive legend. She's really good at holding down a spot extremely well and making it so that people can't really pull you out of that spot easily either. Her walls and fences and such are pretty good if you can put them in spots that allow them to be kind of hidden so that people can't run through doors without getting zapped and getting all the problems caused. Or even on the fly, if you're being chased and you can quickly pop a, a nice fence into like a window to stop anyone from advancing. Also, the intercept pylon is really, really good. That thing being able to just nullify massive amounts of abilities, Gibraltar Ultimate, Bangalore Ultimate, all of Fuse is extremely handy because that or those are abilities that are used to get you out of places and Watson can place a pylon and say, no, we're staying here. See, Watson mains find a way to be a bit more aggressive with her intelligently. They can move their way up, drop the pylon, not just to stop projectiles, but to also keep their shields up so they can have continued gunfights back and forth. And they can use those walls offensively to be able to block off choke points or if someone's gonna try to get you, you could pop your wall real quick so they have to go one way instead of the other and you can force them through like different choke points, kind of like caustic a little bit. There are lots of really big brain ways you could use Watson. It's just, she's a little too defensive for my taste. If you're a more passive player, if you're more of that person who's like, hey, I want to hold an area as opposed to running out there and seeking fights, I think Watson's actually a pretty good choice for you. Regardless though, even though she's not really my cup of tea, she's such a fucking sweetheart, and I'm always happy whenever I see her. I cracked your securities and your face. Ty Jude is a hacker and information specialist who worked with his foster sister for the Syndicate, doing things like creating drones to broadcast the Apex games. However, a bit ago, he stumbled upon a special algorithm that can predict exactly who would win each and every single Apex game. This caught the attention of the Syndicate, and very quickly, his foster sister went missing. And by missing, I mean fucking murdered. With Tai Jun blamed for her death, he now needs to adopt a new face, a new name, and serves in the Apex games not only to try and get more answers, but also to exact his revenge. You know, Crypto actually has a lot more going on with his lore. There's a lot of stuff going on between Revenant, Caustic, Watson, etc. But if you'll forgive me for not understanding all of it, one, because it's about companies and the syndicate and mercenaries and, and hacking and all this stuff, but also, what, are the four Crypto players out there going to be mad at me? Crypto's active as a drone that acts as a mobile camera that he could fly around the place and scan things, know how many people are in the area, open doors, revive players, scan care packages, survey beak. There's like nothing this goddamn drone can't do. In fact, his passive involves more things his drone can do. And then his ultimate is a giant EMP shockwave that comes from his drone. Crypto is a coincidentally ironic character because he's Mr. Hacker Man. He, he's hardcore, angry, Korean hacker guy who you never fucking see because no one fucking plays him. <laughs> Okay, it's actually not that fair. Okay, listen, Crypto Mains, like the five of you that are watching this video, okay? Crypto Mains, let's agree on something together, okay? Let's come to an agreement. Your character has one ability, not three, not a passive, not an active, not an ultimate. One, and that's drone. Everything is drone. Everything revolves around drone. Ultimate is drone. Drone is drone. Passive is drone. And if that drone gets shot out of the sky, you are, like, useless. 
You have to admit that your main, in all intents and purposes, is hindered by this fact that you are nothing but drone. Which is unfortunate because Crypto is not a bad character. Oh no, in fact, he's probably an extremely good character in the right hands, but you need to play Apex totally differently when you play Crypto. Crypto isn't aim related. He's he's not about pushing an, an opponent or, or having really great wingman headshots. No, in fact, you stay back. You sit back and you spend time on your drone, looking around, scanning people. And there can be some really big brain plays you can do with Crypto, where you have the drone hovering above an area. Therefore, they're always being scanned, the enemy that is. And then you can go ahead and know exactly where they are and perfectly get headshots as they turn the corner. Or hell, having a great crypto on your team and having them constantly scan different enemies while the, your two teammates push forward allowing them to constantly be right there with their shots and then eventually the emp blast later on crypto is good he's very good it's just you don't play crypto like every other character and to me he's kind of boring because i always feel one step behind i'm always late to the engagement late to the fight unless i've got an octane on my team so i can immediately jump pad in but even so i always feel like i'm so behind when i play crypto because i'm spending all of my time in the drone and i either have one of two options use the drone and all of its fancy abilities to assist my team therefore making a 2v3 but with drone or not have a drone, place it in a spot, hope it doesn't get shot down, and then try and push. And even then, there's so many ifs and buts. A good crypto in a three stack with comms is fucking devastating. Oh my god, the amount of information and power he has is insane but he just feels either a little too slow and boring because you spend so much time in the drone either too hindered because your entire life is drone or at the end of the day the skills you're learning are not apex legend skills that translate to other characters crypto is playing a whole different game he is the most different of all the characters not in a bad way but he's just still really different that being said whenever i have a crypto on my team who knows what they're doing who's able to absolutely have the perfect scans, the best EMPs, the best comms. It is a breath of fresh air. It is amazing. I feel like I'm one step ahead of every other player in the game. And that is the power fantasy. So for those crypto mains out there, the five of you that are just demigods with that drone and with his power, I say to you the exact same thing that my Atlanta, Georgia born friend with his Korean born wife always says to me, come some die y'all. I'm not going to make it quick. That would spoil all the fun. Caleb Cross was human once, a hitman. People needed to die all the time, and Caleb was really good at his job. One day, I don't remember how exactly, but Caleb ceased to be Caleb. He either was brutally injured, died, something like that. But he was the syndicate's pride and joy. He was their hitman. So into a simulacrum he went and into a robot body he goes, completely unaware of the fact that he is now a robot. Everything about his life lied to him. His reflection in the mirror, his skin, his apartment, his toothbrush, all of it a complete lie, a trick to make sure that he thought he was still human. Until one fateful night when he got a big piece of glass chunk like, fucking shanked into his goddamn neck and then he realized the truth of what had happened he had died many many times and every time he died he awoke again in a brand new robot body with his mind completely wiped but not anymore and how long has this been going on for 300 years he was a pawn, a tool used for the Syndicate and Hammond Robotics, and the people who did this to him were three centuries long dead. But that does not mean he will not get his revenge. It's too late to kill the people who made me, but I can take it out on you. Revenant's passive allows him to climb up and down things a lot faster and also have the same crouching movement speed as he has normal movement speed. His active is a silence ability that fires out in a little bit of ball, stopping people from using their abilities. And his ultimate is a death totem, where by touching it, you don't get any shield, but by the time you actually get killed, you'll just be sent right back to the death totem instead of actually dying. Revenant's a pretty fucking metal character 
no pun intended, a little pun intended. Not only is his voice fantastic, but when you consider his lore, he's actually got really well written lore, and he's got lots of good reasons to be pretty goddamn pissed off. It's an interesting, ironic variation of the psycho robot, because yes, he's a psychotic murdering robot, but he really wants to die. It's not where he just wants to kill as many people as he can, I mean, he kind of does, but he wants to have his life end. He wants his suffering to be over. As a character, he plays actually a bit passive, surprisingly. More passive than I'd like. Honestly, his passive feels really weak. I mean, if Valkyrie can fly up and down basically everything, and Revenant's supposed to be the stocky killer, why not just give him unlimited climb? Like, he should be able to do unlimited climb. It's not like his teammates can go with him. It just helps him a lot to get to places. His Q silence is pretty helpful. It's actually really detrimental when you get hit by it, but sometimes you're not able to aim it perfectly, and it's a little here or there sometimes. But his ultimate is easily his best part of his kit, and honestly, one might be one of the best ultimates in the entire game. You use the ultimate so you can run in there and deal as much damage as you possibly can, and then, you know, you get shot and you go all the way back. But even so, it does feel like people have taken the route of using it in very safe ways, like placing down the death totem and then using an octane jump pad so that even when they get sent back, they can just fly in again without really being attacked again. It's weird. Revenant's kind of weird. I feel like his kit doesn't match his playstyle very much, or his lore, at least. You expect him to be played like Octane, super hardcore in the face of the enemy, just brutal murderer, but he feels like this weird in-between where he's not necessarily like a Watson passive, but he's not as hardcore in the face of the enemy as he should be. Revenant feels a little weak, if I'm being honest. I feel like his death totem is fine, but I think his silence, as well as his like wall climbing, really needs some kind of update because he just feels like he doesn't play like he should, like the crazy Rule robot he is. I mean, at this point, if I play Revenant, I'm playing him for his voice lines just so I can hear him be extremely mean to other people. But besides that, I don't know. Our boy Revenant, I think, needs some love. And I think Revenant mains, the few that are out there, probably agree. I'm a man eater and a lady killer. I enjoy variety. Lucky for us, Loba Andra Andrade, Andrade mm, is much easier to explain now that we got Revenant out of the way. Loba had both of her parents extremely painfully murdered in this cinematic you're currently watching. There they are, there they are, they're dead now. Loba grew up with her foster parents and like her actual parents, she was really good at stealing things. And that was what elevated her out of the gutter of society was how good she was as a thief. Utilizing any and all attributes, whether that is a simple lock pick or some more fancier tools, other people, or even just her good looks and charm, she was able to get almost anything she wanted through sheer thievery. It wasn't until she broke into a really high security facility that she was able to fashion herself one of her translocating bracelets, which now allows her to teleport across the place by just throwing that bastard anywhere she wants, and really creating a pretty impressive arsenal of thief tools. But even with her ability to get pretty much anything she wanted and the high life in her grasp, that internal part of her wasn't satisfied because Revenant had now joined the Apex Games, and that was the last thing on her bucket list to take, was that bastard's life. And hey, you know, if she can take some nice shiny things in the Apex Games, why would she ever say no to that? The Loba Revenant dynamic is actually something that has been expanded upon quite a bit, and is probably the best consistent expansion lore in the game currently. Revenant is now very aware of Loba being extremely upset with him for, you know, murdering her parents. And Loba is now very aware that Revenant actually wants to die. So instead of actually finding the source code and destroying it, she took it and launched it across the fucking galaxy, never to be seen again. So now all these years and all this time, Revenant has tried to find his source code so he can finally die. Loba just took all of that work and crushed it. And whoa, is he pissed. It's a very interesting dynamic where neither person really wants to kill each other, 
but hates each other's guts to a massive degree. Loba is very obviously the TNA character, right? The incredibly attractive, flirtatious character that everyone makes all the fan art about. But compared to the fan art characters in so many other games, they did a really good job at giving her solid lore and backstory to really make it seem genuine. She's the femme fatale. She's the wolf in sheep's clothing. And her kit does a great job with that because her passive allows her to see high tier purple and gold loot through walls. And not only that, but her bracelet lets her throw it and teleport just like you'd imagine. And also her ultimate is the black market, which is an immobile marketplace that allows you to grab items from anywhere in a certain vicinity, including death boxes. That is a thief's kit. And now that the bracelet actually fucking works, it's a really good kit. And what's best about it is that if you want to thirst play Loba, if you want to play Loba just so you can look at hips that can shatter the fucking San Andreas fault, cool, because you're still really helpful to your team. She's a great team player. You have no idea how many times I've hot drop landed as Loba and immediately seen a purple shield and went to that instead of any of the other stuff around me. It has saved me so much. The bracelet is extremely handy just as a, you know, navigation movement tool. And the black market, no one can complain about the black market. Loba's a great team player. She's wonderful to have on your team. She's fun to have on your team and she plays really well. Honestly, the only thing that really held Loba back for the longest time was that damn fucking bracelet that never goddamn worked. And now it's still a little bit buggy, but it's, oh, oh my God, it's so much better. Loba mains, you have my respect. You are people who have stuck with her the entire time through all the thick and thin and are finally being rewarded for your dedication. I never complain when I have a Loba on my team. I never feel bad playing Loba. She is the perfect neutral character. She's never too overpowered. She's never underpowered. She's never a bad pick. She is a perfect medium and they did her great justice. Ah, uh, don't kill yourself over this. I'm already doing that. Ramya Perek. Fair, I don't know, this doesn't matter. She is the Apex Rosie the Riveter. She is a mechanic, an artificer, a weaponsmith, an armorer. She is all of the things that involves creating weapons of war. She is a standard blue collar woman who owns a hardcore shop that people come to her when they need something fixed or they need a new thing to kill someone with. She's the mechanic that almost everyone loved and everyone respected something with her name on it. Almost everyone, at least. Until another group, who apparently were not a big fan of her or her shop, decided to burn it to the fucking ground and beat her ass. She awoke her entire life's work in flames or ash with an Apex Legends invitation card right next to her face. And truly understanding the idea that it's not about the stuff you've built, it's about who built them. Rampart now joins the Apex Games because now she's got plenty of people to test her new wild creations on. And as far as she's concerned, with her little bit of a psychotic side, something to fire a big gun at is a good day for her. Passively, Rampart loves LMGs, and LMGs have a faster reload speed and a larger magazine whenever she uses them. Her active is an amped wall, not the A wall from Titanfall, okay, way weaker than that. But it's an amped cover that's one way cover that increases the damage of your bullets going through your way, and though it can be shot and destroyed by enemies. And finally, her ultimate is Sheila, an immobile gigantic minigun that just unleashes a torrent of bullets anywhere she sets its eyes to. Rampart seems like she's a little bit lower on the end of lore right now, mainly because there's not a whole lot to her backstory. She had a shop, people liked her, shop burned down, hey, you want to join the games? And she's like, yeah, hell yeah. She's got quite the wild side, and, and besides the fact that she's got major DTF eyes in the lobby screen, which always kind of unsettled me because it, DTF is not down to fuck, it's down to fuck you up with the goddamn full ammo spitfire. <laughs> oh yeah, also, Rampart and Mirage are roommates which leads to some really interesting Mirage interactions. Bloody thanks, Crikey, mate. I don't speak English. 
Basically, she loves guns. She loves to shoot guns. She makes walls to shoot guns better. She has a giant fucking gun as an ultimate. Rampart is when you just really badly want to shoot people with really big guns with lots of ammo. Obviously, she's a defensive legend, right? She makes one-way covers an area. She has an immobile turret. She has higher magazines to provide suppressing fire on all of her LMGs. She's a very obviously defensive legend. However, I'd say she can be a little bit more aggressive than Watson. Not with Sheila, however. Sheila is definitely one of those, like, you need to have a lot of cover, and you plant this minigun, and then you go to town with it. But for everything else, yeah, you can run up to somebody and slam down a couple covers really quickly to give yourself a really good firing point for both you and your teammates and then you know blast whoever's in front of you the thing i like about rampart is that for a while she was considered the worst legend in the entire game like she was considered terrible but i always found myself winning as rampart like i got lots of wins specifically with rampart and it felt weird but then i kind of backed myself up a little bit and i reminded myself about how battle royale games are supposed to function in games like battlefield call of duty hell even titanfall the fps part of the game is the major 90% of it, the movement, the shooting, all that stuff. A lot of times people forget that in Battle Royale games, a large amount of it involves positioning. It involves having your back to the ring, knowing where is a good spot to set up shop and where are really bad spots to set up shop. The FPS parts are important, but they're like 60% of a Battle Royale game. There's a large amount of the game entirely dedicated to movement, to positioning, to ring knowledge. And if you take Rampart, perhaps some kind of recon legend to scan the survey beacons, and you're able to know where a really good end game circle is, and you set up a good spot, you're gonna be impossible to crack. And that's why I think I've won a lot with Rampart is because I'm being forced to understand the movement game. I'm forced to understand the positioning game more because I'm playing a legend that rewards good positioning. I remember circles would end at orbital battery on Olympus and then someone with a Rampart would just set up on the top blocks of orbital battery and I, what am I gonna do about that? I have to run through a giant open field. What in God's name am I gonna be able to do about that rampart, okay? She and all of her teammates have either giant guns with increased damage or a big fucking minigun. Am, am I supposed to push that? Am I supposed to push that? With what? Oh God, imagine if you have a Watson on their team too. Slap the intercept pile on. You can't even grenade her out of the sky. I really think rampart is a character that you should play if you're a little bit newer to the game because they teach you the unsung importance of playing a battle royale game, which is positioning. I find myself doing better when I play Rampart because I'm learning the game at a more fundamental level instead of just aim, 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 wingman, 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 headshot, headshot, headshot. When you play Rampart, you're not playing COD or, or Titanfall or Battlefield, you're playing something where positioning really matters and Rampart is the queen of that. Spotted a drone. Dinner worry, Newt. You're cuter. Dr. Mary Summers was a scientist. Well, still is, I guess, but she used to live on Olympus many years ago, and Olympus was facing a massive energy crisis. But she found out, along with her assistant, that you can actually solve that energy crisis by getting this special kind of crystal only available at the accretion disk of a black hole. So she set on out to go get that thing to save her entire city, it's city in the sky, really. After the crystals were on board, her assistant, who was either just a total bitch or jealous or whatever, I really don't care, she's long dead, cut her line so that she ended up orbiting the black hole. Now, with just some amazing Scottish mom energy, she turned a fucking Roomba vacuum into a fancy device to allow her to escape this black hole's orbit, but not fast enough, because being so close to a black hole for so long means that 87 years had passed, which means her as a mother to her son named Newton had watched her son grow up, grow old, and pass away all within that short span of time for her, but 87 years for him. So now Dr. Mary Summers joins the games to fund her scientific research to learn how to travel back in time so that she could be with her son once again. And even though that story is fucking heartbreaking. Luckily, there is a silver lining because in one of the events, you can actually find a message that Horizon sends to her younger self saying that she was able to discover it, she did it, she reunited with her son, 
all that kind of stuff. So future Horizon has told current Horizon that you did do it, keep working hard, you'll get there eventually. Horizon's passive allows her to slip and slide and land with nice grace and, and ease thanks to her jump jet suit. Her active is a reverse gravity spire, sending her and her teammates upwards, and her ultimate is a giant black hole she throws the damn Roomba out with to suck enemies out of their positions. Horizon has Wraith and Octane Syndrome. Horizon, for the longest time, was probably the most powerful, overpowered legend in the entire game because she is so fucking strong. Scottish mom has everything. Thin hitbox, really good at being able to immediately engage after falling, no slowdown, nothing like that. Great movement potential for both herself and her team, and a fantastic offensive ultimate to pull people out of the secure area they're currently in. Overall, Horizon has everything an offensive legend could have, and more. She is so overtuned, and after multitudes of nerfs, she's still pretty fucking good. But even so, that has attracted the obvious players, you know, the Wraith players, the Octane players, which is so unfortunate because like Octane being such a fun, loving, speedy Gonzales man, Horizon's just a sweet Scottish mom. She's a sweet, smart Scottish mother. And then she's got those fucking people playing her. Why do you have to ruin all of the really good people? Get the toxic players on Revenant, okay? Because at least his personality matches yours. Get them on Caustic, so the personalities flesh together. Why do they have to be on fucking Horizon? She's so sweet when I can understand what the fuck she's saying. Honestly though, like, she's so good. She's so good. She's got everything, the, the hitbox, the landing, the movement, the, the ultimate. She's got everything that you could ask for in a character. She is so, so good. And honestly, with a few more nerfs here or there, she'll still be really damn good. But I want to make sure that Horizon can stay at, let's say, great and not broken tier. She was broken for a bit. Now I definitely say she's probably pretty great. I'm not great enough at Apex to truly understand the perfect uh, like amalgamation of balance, but regardless, I really like Horizon as a character. I like her personality, I like her design, I think she's a lot of fun and she's fun to have around, and so I hope that she can still stay really good, but not become, you know, that character. For everyone else, Scottish Mom is awesome, I love her, she's the best, play her. Oh, you having a whinge, mate? Well, go on then, have a good sook. Walter Fitzroy is a Salvonian, which is just space Australian, honestly. And he was friends, lifelong friends, with someone named Maggie, or Mad Maggie. They were freedom fighters for Salvo, Salvo, Salvo. That's ironic, I never thought about that, Salvo, like bombs and shit. <laughs> Big governments, big companies, the syndicate, all these people hounded over Salvo. And Mad Maggie hated it every waking second of her life. And the two of them were freedom fighters growing up. They were constantly going through the dirt and scrap of their planet to constantly do whatever they could to make it so that they had control of Salvo, not the syndicate, none of these people. At least that was Maggie's want. Fuse just liked to fight. The Syndicate provided a fantastic option to fight, but really Fuse just enjoyed the battle. He enjoyed the competition. He enjoyed the fun of it. Where Maggie saw a revolution, Fuse saw a gladiatorial boxing match. And eventually, as time went on, Fuse saw the best gladiatorial arena he could possibly join the Apex Games, ran by the Syndicate. And Maggie didn't like this a whole lot. In fact, she really hated it that she blew off his arm with a grenade. And Fuse, being the absolute Giga Chad that he is, was like, oh, anyway. And now with a new robot arm, Fuse encapsulates every extremely, excessively stereotypical Australian stereotype you could possibly take, and it's fucking awesome. The man loves explosions, he loves beer, he loves hunting, he loves playing his guitar around a campfire, and he's 54 years old, ready to blast your ass to the past. In a sense, Fuse at the Apex Games is home. 
Passively, fuse can stack two grenades per grenade slot, and you can also fire them way farther and faster. His active is a cluster grenade that he can also fire from his same wrist-mounted launcher that his new robot arm provides, and his ultimate is a giant ring of napalm fire that he fires high up into the air to surround an enemy. Fusey is a blast to play. He reminds me a little bit of Watson, in the sense that just seeing them gives me this big smile on my face because he is able to ride that line between being silly but making it fun. He's the fun-loving Australian stereotype uncle and he has this way of creating like charm laughing. Because you even look at his select screen, right, where he throws a goddamn explosive behind him, winks to the camera, and then it explodes. That, with anyone else, would be seen as weird, awkward, or cringy, but not with Fuse. With Fuse, every time I see it, it just makes me giggle. All the things he says, all the things he does is great because Fuse does it. Because he just exuberates this charm, this fun, the fun-loving uncle at the barbecue. That is his persona entirely, and he's just a blast to play. Now, for a while, Respawn was very adamant on saying that legends should not kill you with their abilities. Another one of the reasons why Caustic was nerfed the way he was. However, Fuse is one of those characters that you could tell they really didn't want to kill you with his abilities, so he feels a bit weak at times. Now, when the stars align and Fuse gets what he wants, like this clip I'm about to show you, Oh, it's pretty great. Enemy. But those clips aren't extremely often. He's getting some buffs now. He can now stack two grenades on his cluster with his special active ability. But overall, there are still some things that are holding Fuse back. Like he can't use his ultimate inside an area. He can only do it outside because it launches upwards. And often I find myself either getting caught out or at a bad time whenever I fire my large amounts of grenades or my Q because I'm not, you know, shooting my gun during that period of time. It's not like I can just be firing my gun and then throw a grenade with my other hand. No, I have to stop firing to do it. So unless you're forcing people out of areas, which I do understand is kind of his point, it can feel a little bit tough to play Fuse in a, in a direct 1v1 gunfight. That being said, early game Fuse is pretty terrifying. Firing that cluster grenade, let's say a pillbox that someone's gonna go try and loot, could actually be pretty devastating, or covering a door that they're trying to run through. Fuse mains main like Ridley. You know, not because they're great or overpowered or meta or anything, they're just like, eh, I like that dragon. I've been playing Metroid for a while, I like Ridley. That's Fuse. I main Mirage because I think he's a lot of fun and because I like to flex on people using proper bamboozles. I play Fuse because I want to smile. I play Fuse because I just want to like throw out a couple of grenades and just enjoy myself. Fuse is the physical personification of a family barbecue with a family you actually like. It's chill, it's nice, and overall it's good times all around. Ugh, I'm starving. Is anyone else starving? It's an ovary for some ramen right now. Do I even need to cover Valkyrie? Do I even need to cover Valkyrie? Like, me, the Titanfall 2 fanboy? Do I need to cover- uh, I'll find I'll cover Valkyrie. Kyrie Imahara was daughter to call sign Viper, a very wealthy and top dollar mercenary for the Apex Predators. One day he left, and he never came back, because we killed him. She dreamed all her life of flying titans. But with that dream no longer really being a reality, she sailed for the next possible pilot position she could, spending all of her days smuggling cargo and making a good living during it, while spending all of her nights either gambling, drinking, or finding all the ladies in the room. But regardless of how she spent her days and nights, she was always entirely interested in getting to Blisk, the man who she believed killed her father. Not literally, but you know, had ran the mercenary group and therefore, in a sense, killed her father through the mission that he put her dad through. Us who played Titanfall 2 you know that's kind of stupid logic, but through like his daughter's eyes, it makes a lot of sense. You know, she doesn't know what we know as players. However, when she finally did get to confront Blisk, he spoke of her father with, you know, conviction, with impressive tact. 
and she soon realized the actual truth of the matter and settled for just the knowledge that she could have killed Blisk. Firing into his glass instead of him, the knowledge of knowing she could have done it was enough for her. So now she goes ahead and actually does what she's always wanted to do, to fly similarly to her father and compete in the games doing stuff that he kind of did. She can compete in the games now flying her new North Star and actually somewhat carry on the legacy of her dad. Passively, she can see other players flying down from the dropship or when she's flying down either way, like a jump tower or such. And also she can fly around just in general with some jump jets because she can't shoot during it. Her active fires a giant cluster of missiles that does damage and also disorients players. And her ultimate has her turn into a human jump tower for both her and her teammates flying high up into the air. Now Valkyrie definitely looked like she was going to be busted when she was first announced. All of her abilities look really crazy. I thought she was going to be a five out of five star horizon launch character. She's not. She's very good though. She's like a four out of five. She's a damn good legend. Great movement, great reposition, not really much damage if I'm being totally honest, but that's not really the point of the missiles to begin with. She does not disappoint. She's not overpowered, but she does not disappoint. I really like what they've done with Valkyrie. She emanates her father quite a bit. Now, a lot of people have this idea that Viper was somehow a good guy. He's not. He killed a lot of people, and he also was serving for the mercenary group that served for the IMC, which was about to, you know, commit genocide. Honestly, like, you might say, oh, he was just being paid for. You have your morals. He may have been a good dad, so to speak, but being a good dad doesn't necessarily mean that you didn't murder a lot of people. <laughs> Though Valkyrie really carries the same expressions as her father, and I really like that. The reason Viper has like Boba Fett syndrome, because he barely had any like screen time in Titanfall 2, but the small screen time that he had was incredibly interesting because all of the other Apex Predators were kind of savage or brash or angry, where he was calm and tactical. He was a much more professional mercenary compared to all of his compatriots, but he had this, this personality that no one else really had in the Apex Predators mercenary group, but he still had a little bit of a cockiness to him. For every single copy, move hard right, bearing two, three, five, whatever, there was the other, you, you hear, hear that, that ringing in your ears, son? son. And that is exactly how Valkyrie feels. Her voice lines remind me a little bit of Bangalore where she's constantly like, copy, let's move to this zone. Let's much more military or like pilot jargon, but she still has plenty of nice, you know, stick the knife in deeper voice lines to go along with it. She definitely is her father's daughter. This really feels like a passing of the torch in a way. Titanfall 3 is asked for almost daily. And honestly, I would love to see a Titanfall 3, but we're kind of, in a sense, past that point. Titans and the pilots, the military pilots, the, the famed demigod Jedi, almost, are not a thing anymore. Bliss says it himself. The frontier wars are over. It's been decades. And really, when you think about it, the need for these military pilots just aren't a thing anymore. Bliss sure as shit isn't doing it. This kind of feels like a passing of the torch a little bit. Titanfall 3 is asked for, day in and day out. Every single day, Titanfall 3 is asked for. And in fact, they ask for it a little bit too often and kind of in a little bit of a pissy fit sort of way, telling themselves over and over again that because we got Apex, we'll never get a Titanfall 3, besides the fact that that's obviously completely false and stupid and there are many possible reasons why there might not be a Titanfall 3, such as Titanfall 2's disastrous launch. But Apex is fun. Is it a cash cow? Yeah. Does it have problems? Yeah. But compared to every other battle royale on the market, and even so, it's not just battle royale anymore. The arena modes are fun. They're actually really enjoyable and different. Well, different. I mean, it's CSGO, Valorant, whatever, but get the point. The lore, the universe, the gameplay, all of it is miles ahead of every other battle royale out there. Even if we did get a Titanfall 3, it wouldn't be the same. It would have to be a prequel or they'd have to create some kind of force storyline to go along with it and randomly determine that the universe now has Titans again and bada bang, bada boom. It really does feel like a passing of the torch. Valkyrie, she was related to Titanfall 2. She took one of the most popular Titanfall 2 bosses' Titans and has refitted it for her needs. The universe 
has grown. The dismantling of the North Star, the dismantling of the Frontier Wars story being fitted for the Apex Games and the new story. It is the old blood, the old machine, and the new young competitor. It is the passing of the torch. It feels like Respawn is saying, hey, that's done. We did it. This is what we have now. Does that make me sad? Of course it does. I would kill for a Titanfall 3. But Apex is fun. Apex is well made. And I can't complain if this game sticks around. If we get a Titanfall 3, I will be ecstatic. But if we don't, I won't be surprised. Thank you everyone very much for watching these two videos. I highly appreciate it. I want to shout out all of my fantastic patrons. Thank you all so much for joining me and all of the members who are a part of the memberships on YouTube. You are all excellent, excellent people. Let me answer a question or two. If Fuse were to grab Loba's ass, would he just palm it or would he get a good grip? Also, would he say Dibsies or that's a Prezi for Fusey? He feels like the guy who would only slap other man's asses. Not because he's gay, but because like... That's just the way he is. It's like old locker room stuff. He'd probably say Dibsy, though. I probably already answered this, but I'm going to answer this one more time just in case I didn't answer this already. I don't really remember. Um, it is, what is your favorite OST from any game? Near Automata. I think Near is the best OST ever created. That's simple put. Done. Number one. What is your opinion on the world of sports? Both esports and conventional. I mean, sports are fine. Esports are fine. I don't know, man. It's, it's sports. Uh, who the hell is Steve Jobs? Ligma balls?